many of you have come and so many friends of Marriott's and, and people that I know as well. Um, on the occasion of Marriott's first exhibition at Clamp Art, uh, Brian Clamp is here with us today, along with Elaine Wong um, and Marriott and I. And um, first, uh, I'd like to introduce Elaine, who is a scientist and inventor and a long-term friend of Marriott's who um, is in Marriott's book, Transformations. Um, not in the exhibition, but was part of the project and is in, in the book. Um, Elaine and I met, I don't know if you remember Elaine, but we met at Marriott's years ago. Uh, it's nice to see that you. That was possible, yeah. Yes. And um, Brian Clamp, who, whose gallery is on 29th Street in Chelsea, um, who will be um, showing us installation pictures and images from Marriott's show. And Marriott, whom yeah. I'd like to introduce now, who has worked for over 40 years um, in photography on the sub subject of gender variance and transgender experience. The first book that she published in 1990 Transformations, Cross-Dressers and Those Who Love Them um, was published in conjunction with an exhibition in 1990 at Simon Lewinsky Gallery. So this is, uh, um, it's, I think there may have been other exhibitions that published some of the work or pr presented right. some of the work, yeah, but- it's been in a few. Uh, but not not like this. <laughs> but in this case, you know, yeah. at the time, Marriott um, printed eleven. Uh, I mean, printed portfolios of eleven of the images as dye transfers, and that portfolio, all eleven images, are part of the show, along with black and white images from the same project. Um, I've been in to see the show in the. The prints are just stunning. I mean, dye transfer was the ultimate way to print a color image at the time, and almost nobody does it anymore. It's a it's an elaborate, expensive project uh, process. Um, Marriott produced these uh, wonderful uh, portfolio boxes that the prints went into, and they over the years have gone to a number of different museums and institutions. Um, that was the first of Marriott's four books. Um, in 2004, her book Gender Frontier appeared, which uh, was comprised of a lot of the work that she did through the 90s and into the 2000s on political activism, specifically transgender activism. It included portraits of some of the activists that she worked closely with, as well as uh, a representation of transgender youth in that time, and included interviews and um, portraits and documentary photographs. After that, and more recently, she has published the book Transcuba, um, and she's been to Cuba how many times now, Maria? Nine. Nine times. Yeah. Um, and that book came out after you had been there, I think, four times, right? Because yes, only four times. You've been but... back to show the work and to photograph more. And it's obviously about trans experience in Cuba today. After that, uh, the book Transcendence, Spirit Mediums in um, Burma and Thailand was the latest book. Both of those last books were done um, by daylight. Um, and so tonight we're returning to the first book in the first project, which was the culmination of work that Marriott had done starting in the late seventies and through the eighties. So to begin with, Marriott, could you um, tell us 
how that got started. I mean, I'm sure that every interview has begun this way. Um, yes. But you were uh, a document, you were doing different types of photography. You were doing uh, documentary photography. You were doing a project of people in New Jersey that was commissioned, um, that was sort of like a, a family of man type of project, you know, yeah. a representative sample of people in New Jersey, but strangers on the street and in public places. And you were also doing pictures of flowers and fantasy kinds of pictures and a range of types of photographs, including event photos. How did you get into um, transformations? Well, let me step back one second. I started out as a painter and have an MFA in painting and the the flowers and fantasy uh, theories sort of came after, came in a way as part of it. Excuse me, I'm taking a cough drop. Um, as far as transformations is concerned, um, in 1978, uh, my husband and I went to New Orleans for Mardi Gras, and by fluke, we stayed in the same hotel as a group of cross-dressers. Um, and <clears throat> on the last day of Mardi Gras, I came down for breakfast with my camera gear, um, ready to go out. And the, I saw this magnificent table of, uh, to me, very exotic people. And they invited me to join them for breakfast. So of course I did. Um, my husband had left hours before in his jester costume. And so uh, these very friendly people invited me to join them. And then after breakfast, they all got up and outside of the dining room was a swimming pool and they started parading around the pool and then they stopped in a line. There was somebody in their group who was taking pictures and I thought, well, maybe it would be okay for me to take a picture, I had no idea. And so when I, I lifted the camera to my eyes and looked at the group, there was one person in the middle of it looking straight back at me. And I felt like, oh, I'm not looking at a man or, or a woman, I'm looking at a human being. And then my next thought was, I have to have this person in my life. Vicki West <clears throat> turned out to live 20 blocks away from me in New York City. And because of, of this one person, I got to know a certain segment of the transgender community, mostly cross-dressers in those days. And... Um, Can you just stop for a minute and tell us a little bit about Vicki? Because I know that you are also the um yes you have after vicky died you have the collection of vicky's illustrations and drawings and paintings and yes, are art. going to publish them as a book sometime That's in the right. future yeah well uh vicky west was an artist and um as vicky she did the covers for drag magazine and other uh, publications geared to trans people. She also did window design and um, creations. As Dirk, um, she was a book designer for Abrams Publishing Company. So she was a successful artist as a man and as a woman. And um, a very um, delightful person. Unfortunately, she died a while back and uh, her roommate called me over to, to take whatever I wanted. I discovered that all of her, her artwork for drag magazine, et cetera, was in two Saks Fifth Avenue shopping bags. And I took them. There was nobody else who would who wanted them. And I feel like I have a, an absolute treasure trove here. Her work is, is to me fascinating. 
you can see the process she went through from drawing on a paper napkin to the completion of the artwork on the cover of a magazine, every yeah. stage. So it's an education for people who were into printing in those days. And she, she was the one that introduced you to the um, conferences and, and yes. things like Fantasia Fair that right. occurred in Provincetown and Atlanta and things like that, where you were able to meet many people many that you people. photographed, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, she, she sort of took me under her wing and took me wherever she was going, basically, as Vicky. And it was utterly fascinating to me. And I can't tell you how naive I was in those days. I hadn't even hung out at a bar, to be honest. And I was surprised how dark bars were. And it, it was just so, um, I, had, I had to learn very quickly. Um, and it was, it was a natural for me, really, because I had always wondered about the roles of men and women I never understood why men were supposed to behave one way and women were supposed to behave another way. And I took cultural anthropology in high school and had this huge sense of relief because, oh, other cultures uh, did things differently. They, their families were different, their rules were different. And when I was in college, I took more anthropology courses. Sorry? I hear uh, something. I don't know what that. Oh, hi. <laughs> that was Yvonne. Um, and so when I, when I encounter these, all these um, wonderful cross-dressers at the time, I felt I had found um, a hidden tribe, a hidden community and and that and it was very hidden in those days that the people it, people were not out the way they are now. It's almost it's so hard for a young trans folk to realize how isolated and frightened and ashamed a lot of. Um, cross-dressers felt in those days and how hidden they were. Elaine, I, do you want to say something about that? Wherever you are? She disappeared. Um, she's here, but Elaine, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, I've been amazed uh, about uh, Mariette's work in that she does the same thing in terms of gender, but the world sort of changes uh, around her. And so she ends up sampling different parts of the society. Like uh, at the beginning, it was sort of like, oh, the New York area and the Boston area. And then gradually geographically, it grew to people, you know, coming from the, the big cities in America and then the smaller cities and then the rural cities. And so that was sort of geographical distribution. But then there was an age thing in terms of coming in, it was first uh, the older crowd that were really closeted and very paranoid. And then it gradually over the years or something worked all the way down to youngsters basically trying to come out. What I discovered is um, it's the same story, no matter where, you know, we, I used to sort of sit at rumors and we talked to people coming out and it was sort of all the people were struggling, no matter like what demographic, what socioeconomic class or something like that. We, it was kind of boring. We all had the same story. You know, it was like, and uh, I thought Mariette was really shooting the story. Okay. And it's just that the, as I said, the world and the people and the geography changed sort of from under. And so she has sort of like a, it's like a, a, a panograph, a panogram of the, you know, the society in many dimensions. And so, but uh, I think she was trying to hint to, for me to talk about the, the stress. When I first came out, I mean, I was like, um, the first time I went to Provincetown, I was afraid to go out of my room. I mean, I had come across the, this, um, these magazines, you know, in CD bookstores or something like that. And uh, I remember one summer trying to 
prove that I was gay in San Francisco and it just didn't work. And so I was kind of like confused. Um, but then it, it's sort of like, uh, I remember, I think the joke among us the, that got photo photographed by her at the beginning was she liked the angst, the sort of like the, uh, I mean, it's easy to sort of get sort of cross-dressers or uh, tra you know, drag queens in New York. I mean, they want to be seen. And here were the whole population that didn't want to be seen or they, they couldn't even see themselves except through reflected through her pictures. And so it was, um, I think she liked the struggle. And uh, so there were times that I was like freaked out of my mind, first of all, to be photographed. And she has a very convincing way to sort of convince you to do strange things. And I remember one incident, uh, she convinced me to have a few pictures taken. I said, okay, fine. She wanted me to do it in kimono. So I brought my one of my best kimonos. And where did she want it? She wanted to have it on the dunes at the end in Provincetown, in the middle of nowhere. So there are all these signs that say, don't go on the dunes. And Marietta's coming like, come on, come on. Oh, little, the next dune, the next dune. And I was worried about getting lost. I completely trashed uh, a new pair of pantyhose. I mean, that's a that's a feeling <laughs> that I think most guys will just never relate to. It's just absolute like you're devastated because you know, like, oh my God, you know, I paid so much for these pantyhose. Where can I replace them and stuff like that? Or everyone's just going to look at the seam, you know, that I just broke. So we went in the middle of nowhere. I took these pictures, but it was freezing cold. I call it um, the Blue Lip series, and. Um, she took quite a few photographs on the dunes by other people too. And we all share the common experience. Not only were we just completely um, freaked out by the experience, but we're freezing besides. So what happens is I come back and um, I find out my car is snuck in the sand. And this is like about twilight and there's just nobody on the road. And I'm dressed in a full kimono and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, what are we gonna do here? Our, the car is stuck in the sand. And so I tried to flag down um, various, you know, every so often a car would come by and I think they would sort of freak out. Who's this person standing there, you know, on the dunes, you know, in a kimono. And finally this couple from the Midwest stopped and I, I, I think they kind of freaked out, you know. And, but luckily he had sort of a tow chain. And so he comes out or something like that, but um, she's oh, okay, we can, I don't know where to attach it. And I said, oh, I'll do it. And so I climbed underneath my Volvo in a kimono to hook up the tow chain. And uh, this person was completely, this couple was completely flabbergasted. Like what in the world is going on? There's a six foot Asian there dressed up in a kimono, you know, and he's, and it's a he, and he's going underneath his car to attach the tow chain. But we finally got back out of the sand and everything. We thanked them. And I'm sure this is a story that probably lasted their whole lives of what they <laughs> run into in Provincetown. You know, it's like, oh yeah, this is Provincetown. So, um, but that was just one story. And I'm sure all the other people that were photographed by Mariette, um, you know, she just has this sort of stiff upper lips and just keeps on clicking away and disasters <laughs> falling and everything, <laughs> you know, and you're freaked out like, oh my God, you know, what's gonna happen? And as I said, uh, I, I secretly think she, she enjoyed that or it was like vicariously <laughs> going through disasters. Yeah. So. Well, um... <laughs> That's funny. What, Marriott, for you, from your point of view, what were the challenges of, of um, I, I mean, I know that you were aware of a history of uh, representations that were both exploitative and sensational around trans experience and that you were very conscious of, you know, trying to show uh, a full dimension of the people that you were photographing. What, how did you do that? What were the challenges? What did, how did you work with your subjects other than uh, uh, terrorizing them and <laughs> freezing them in the dunes? Oh, by the way, one of the photographs in the exhibition is of um, somebody freezing with a, um, Brian, can you show Valerie, us that? Yes. Can you show there. us that image? Oh, Valerie, yeah, from the glamour shoot. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I can show you quickly here. 
you know, and, and Brian is calling it glamour, which is another question I want to ask yeah. you. Just and also Elaine might address this too. Is just the factor of glamour, um, yeah. what what that means in this context. Is she freezing? This is this is Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> you see how cold she is. She was wearing that fur coat, and she had all this. Uh, we were doing a glamour shoot. And then it got cold and we were, had kind of reached the end and she grabbed her fur coat. And to me, it looks like she's holding a teddy bear. And I felt like um, uh, that she was a child, that, that some part of her that had, she had a difficult childhood sort of came across when she let her, her guard down and held the, the coat. Anyway, um, what was the idea about doing the glamour, though, doing that pose and that kind of outfit? Well, so many people wanted that. Um, you know, we're talking about a pop a population that I was working with at that time. These were not drag artists. These were, as we've said, kind of hidden, frightened. I'll say men um, who were not in the arts. They were they had typically masculine jobs: engineers, um, truck drivers, firefighters, um, CEOs of organizations, uh, <clears throat> and they were not. I never met anybody in the visual arts. Almost never. So <clears throat> when when they decided to um, dare to have a photo shoot with me, it was a very um, emotional experience. And partly, I had to do a lot of coaching, which I don't usually do, uh, because they had no clue how to reach the part of themselves that was really the one the well, what we call the woman who lives inside. So they were people when they po ever posed as men, they would put, they would stand as if they were about to get a passport picture taken, very symmetrically, um, kind of uh, shoulders back and and very straight. And I, I have to. This was a big discovery to me because I hadn't encountered people who saw themselves that way. So what I had to do is gradually, is loosen people up. I got to, I focused on movement and getting people to make different shapes of themselves and to try to relate to the, the woman who lived inside of them. How would she, how would she move? What would she like? Um, and, it was almost a, um, I don't know what I would call it. Uh, coaching. Acting. Coaching. Co well, it was coaching. And then it, it was also, I ended up having to do things like ending up dealing with wigs and makeup and um, things that, and picking out clothing. It was a whole different thing for me. As I said, this was an amazing learning curve. Um, for example, with wigs, generally, they would have their wigs too far forward. So it would come down and, and I would think of it as a thatched roof and kept the light out of their eyes. So I had to try to uh, get their faces out. I mean, there were so many things like that that I could never have predicted. Um, and try to also bring out some feelings of fun and um, lighten things. But for many people, it was a very emotional experience. And for me too, because I could see people sort of breaking out of the strict uh, stereotype of the masculine role. And, and some people were 
in marriages. Some people had children. So there are pictures in which you tried to also portray um, family life, right? Right, and that took a while. I mean, as I was doing this, I had no idea where the work was going. But the more I did it, the more I, it became really clear that this work had to come out um, for two reasons. One was so that there was something that um, cross-dressers and other transgender people could find that they could relate to because up till then, um, they would find images in porn shops and which they couldn't relate to. They didn't, that's not who I am is how they felt, even though these were people who were also cross-dressed. The other place to find images were in um, medical tomes, medical books, and that wasn't who they were either. So I wanted to create a, the book that they could use, um, that they could relate to. And ultimately it became the book they used to tell their wives, to tell their families who they were. It was, um, it was as useful as I had hoped it would be. And I was told that it saved marriages. I was even told it saved lives. I mean, I was, so my I know that uh, I remember Zachary Drucker mentioning that um, when they were doing the part of the series Transparent, which Zachary was a co-producer of, um, Zachary got copies of the book Transformations to everyone on set so that it could understand that period in the 80s that the, the series flashes back to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because, you know, Transparent was made so many years later that a lot of people didn't quite understand that shift, uh, shift oh, in shift. nuances. Yeah. Oh, I did it. And um, yeah. Well, the other reason for doing this book, besides um, finding something that they could connect to, finding images they could connect to, was I wanted to show the outside world that, you know, people thought of cross-dressers as monster, monsters, like in the way they were portrayed in certain movies and literature and in other photographers' work. I wanted to show that these are people who are lived pretty ordinary lives, but had this need to express themselves in more than one way. And so over time, I tried to find uh, uh, wives and partners who would be, sh that I could photograph with their, uh, their partners. And then towards the end, when I was really pushing for a book, um, I tried to find people who, could be photographed with their children. This was not easy, I can tell you. Um, I put out a, a notice about it and I kept getting a very um, strange phone calls. And after a while I would recognize the voices. I knew, oh, that's the lamp salesman again. <laughs> anyway, it took me um, 50, 50 attempts to find a publisher. Finally, on the fifth, believe it or not, the 50th attempt, I did get a publisher. Let's look at some of the photographs again. Yeah. Um, and so we can ask you questions specifically about them. Um, and Elaine, feel free also to join yeah. in. Um, so um, there's someone with their child. Yes. So that was one of the rare people who could yes. manage to do that for you. Okay. And I just, yeah, it was kind of a miracle that I found her. She wrote to me and said, I hear you're making a book about heterosexual cross-dressers, but I'm gay. Are you still interested in me? I can pose with my daughter. I said, of course. 
of course, I'm not specifically making a book on heterosexual cross-dressers, but most of them claim that they were. So that's what Paula had heard. And um, I noticed after he'd taken the picture, I mean, this look, this daughter was so sweet and lovely. You can't make the picture any busy, but I, I realized at the end that I that they created a heart shape. I wasn't aware of that when I was. What's what's that. the year of this picture? Do you remember? It's the eighties, I think, towards the end, around could be as late as eighty seven. Because the book came out in ninety. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, one question I have for you is, in recognizing um, how misunderstood this group of people was like and your interest in um giving you know giving attention to their like full dimension there's a, a deference no doubt to you know a sensitivity and a deference to their um feelings about being portrayed how did you balance that respect and deference with um you know, your own needs as an artist to get a portrait that is a good and not necessarily a good portrait, but one that doesn't necessarily, you know, express joy or happiness. For instance, the mm -hmm. one that we're seeing there in the jacket and the fur coat mm -hmm. is, that would be an example, I would say, of you're making a good portrait, but, you know, I'm I'm sure that through this process there was this balancing act for you, or or you know, a consideration yeah. about how do you balance what you see with what needs to be um, yeah. how something needs to be portrayed, what the community yeah. needs. Right. Well, I mean, most people really just want to smile and look good and look happy and um i remember one person saying to me you took a horrible picture of me and i said oh really what what did i do she said well i wasn't smiling so i mean that is so common you know as soon as somebody raises the camera the automatic reaction is to look at that person and smile but i you know i would say i'm not i'm not looking for you to pose necessarily and and i'm not looking um um i'm just trying to see who you are that's basically it um that and i i want to see something of i wanted to see catch something of who they were inside as well as as how they were how they looked on the outside um well we have this picture up because it's or actually brian you can go to another one i i want to ask this question because it's something that i've talked to my students about i i feel like you're talking about who they are inside but yeah. who, who are you inside because i think good portraiture is not just you know it's also some balance between that subject and your projection onto the subject, some reflection of yourself in the subject, some way in which you identify with the subject, um, that identification creates intensity and leads to a stronger kind of portrait. You know, like if you think of all the great portraits in painting history, we don't care if any of them were a likeness. Yeah. We care in as much as they reflect the artist that painted them and their, you know, style and their particularities as an artist. So in looking at this picture in front of us, um, where are you in that picture? How is that a reflection of yourself, do you think? I think it reflects uh, quite literally my confusion or questioning about what is a man, what is a woman, because if you see the reflection of this person onto the mirror table, if you turn this around, like it, 
to me, it looks like a tarot card. If you turn it around, then you see a depiction of a man. But this way, looking at it this way, um, you see a, a very um, sort of pretty um, femi kind of woman. And sort of uh, even a little bit formal, you know, maybe even a little prissy. And I think that reflects me very well. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, in the end, you're a Vassar alum. You're, yeah. <laughs> Not my fault. Well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but then, then my, my life got a little more fun after that. Um, anyway, so. Um, I'm, I, I want to ask Elaine about that. Yes. Um, Elaine. Could could you answer that from you've known Marriott for many years? Like, how do you see Marriott reflected in these portraits? Can you? I felt like she was searching also. You know, she was using her camera as sort of an excuse to explore the gender domains and you know the, the dimensions. And um, it, it's about uh, how far can you push the boundaries or. I mean, all of us in the pictures are pushing boundaries from our own perspective. And so I think she sort of admired um, these explorers or pioneers and uh, what they sort of made out of the wilderness and created. So, uh, but her interest in that, I think reflected upon um, sort of, uh, you know, we all have our struggles. And so she was like figuring out in terms of some things that she was trying to deal with, uh, with all these pictures. Mm -hmm. Like I have one um, thing that sort of struck me by surprise. Um, I have a, f uh, a picture where I'm sort of like in leather and all sort of like almost hugging or very defensive of myself. And when she took it, I was like, oh, I was kind of upset because I wasn't smiling. But after I looked at it, I said, oh my God, she got behind the eyes, you know, I was in a job that I was getting battered constantly, but I couldn't show anybody that my weakness. And so here it is, I'm all dressed up in leather and trying to look tough, but it just sort of, the vulnerability was just written all over the picture. And so um, I think she knows how to recognize that vulnerability. And uh, you might say cynically, that's what she goes for but uh, that's what she's exploring in, um, in men or in a lot of her subjects. Mm. Thank you, Elaine. And I totally agree with you. I mean, I guess I do look for vulnerability and access. Um, can I reach that person? Can I know that person? Um, can we relate in some way? You can I, just look at the eyes of, uh, in a lot of these portraits, they say everything. Yeah. One. Um, well, I think also, you know, another aspect of, of portrait, portraiture is that um, everybody doesn't want to be a photographer, but a lot of people do want to be paid attention to and they want their story told they want to be represented and you know there's a kind of um, mutual support you're you're telling their story for them and they're enacting your story for you and there's a trade mm -hmm. and when when the person really wants to tell that you know, it often makes them a great subject. And, and there are people that you photographed over periods of years who were great subjects for you. Yes. Um, particularly, you know, as seen in transgender, I mean, in uh, Gender Frontier, mm -hmm. since that represented 15 years of work. Um, and you see that there were relationships that you created and people that you photographed repeatedly because they wanted to give you so much of their story. Yeah, that's true. 
I mean, it's vulnerability and intimacy. And, and so I think that is what, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. And, um, and, and that's how the, that's the, how I can have this collaboration. Um, should we take some questions from our wonderful audience? Um, there are some questions. There's a question from someone that's, you know, could you talk about expanding that, the population that you documented? I mean, um, in the four different books, each one is kind of addressed to different um, realms of transgender experience and and also different um, cultures. Okay. Well, Alan already spoke about the gender frontier and it shows the evolution of the community up to around the, say the early nineties to the early two um, thousands. Um, at that point, I felt that um, what I needed to do basically had been done. Um, conferences, for example, used to be very, very important and emotional for people to find people like themselves to explore all different aspects of gender. The conference has changed and with um, digital photography, for example, everybody was running around taking pictures of everybody else. Um, and it wasn't a, a important so much about, um, the, they were quick documentations of what were you wearing that day, essentially. And I um, didn't feel that I could make that much of a contribution at that point, although I continue to take pictures. Um, so I thought, you know, everything in my life is maybe for everybody else is a fluke, but I had always wanted to go to Cuba because I so admire Mariela Castro Espin. She uh, is the, uh, she's Fidel Castro's niece. And she's a lovely woman who has an organization that works um, with LGBT people. And she's done so many things, I don't want to continue to list them. But a group that I belong to, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, they were invited to, she's, oh, I should say Mariella is a sexologist. So she had invited a group to go to Cuba for a conference and I thought, I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm part of this community, I can go. And I went and um, immediately I found my next subject, which was three women, three transgender women and whose lives I followed all nine times. One of them, the first person I actually uh, met has died in the meantime of AIDS. Um, but anyway, I got to know the Cubans, the Cuban women who, most of whom had to be um, um, sex workers because once they transitioned, they couldn't change their names, they couldn't get jobs, et cetera. So that became a, that was a fantastic community. They, they were such um, uh, wonderful people. They just were, and, and then I, the book, my book got published probably me prematurely and because I kept going back and making new pictures and some of which were much better than what I had in the book. But then I, um, through a colleague at the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, Eli Coleman, he is, is um, a professor in the area of human sexuality and he had explored cultures around the world where gender variance was an intrinsic part of that 
community. And he told me about spirit mediums in Burma and Thailand. Who, and it's very complicated to explain all that, but the, I'll try to do it in a sentence. Um, they are, because traditionally uh, spirit mediums were women and their uh, gift was to transfer messages from spirits to humans. They were sort of in between. And they gradually over time, um, more men and transgender people, transsexuals, um, became, in, became spirit mediums. It's just an evolution that occurred. And so what was interesting was to get to know this group of people who um, generally very peaceful, very comfortable, very accepted in their community because they were needed. They are the ones who could tell you through the spirits, okay, is this a good time to get married? Is this a time to build your house? Um, is your aunt gonna get well? Important questions. And these spirit mediums, they were all very different from each other. And although I can't speak the language, I always had an interpreter with me. And um, I, it was just extraordinary. I loved going to the festivals. There were many festivals or hubs parties or events and very different kinds of people. Um, so Marriott, I have the there's community. A, yeah. There's, there's a good question from Mark Oram LeClay in the chat. Okay. And um, he says the discourse on who has the license to tell whose story, which is very much, you know, a contemporary discourse. Yes. Um, especially in documentary and portraiture. Um, did that exist back, he's saying, did that exist back when you started your work with communities that you were not directly a part of? Was it something that you were concerned about? Uh, not really. I felt very welcomed and I felt like I was doing something that wasn't being done. Um, you know, there were very few photographers who were trying to reach people in the way that I was. Um, it, this is a subject that I find very difficult and actually painful, uh, this question. Um, because it makes me feel unwelcome uh, with whatever I would do, you know, unless I were. Um, it I it is a tough subject. Yeah. I think that, you know, that it's part of this discourse that's mm -hmm. been occurring over the last 40 years vis-a-vis -vis documentary photography yeah. about yeah. documentarians going into other cultures, like being able to, um, explain who they are and why they're working the way that yeah. they're working. And, you know, I feel like it can go too far in one direction to preclude anyone photographing anybody that's not, you know, part of their very own world yeah. or also saying to someone who's of a particular demographic that they are responsible to represent that demographic. And of course, I think, you know, what happens with writers and artists is that often you want to address something that you don't actually understand or know something about. So you're attracted to subjects that involve otherness. Mm -hmm. But um, because a lot of times it's hard to see the circumstances around yourself, your own circumstances to get enough distance or detachment to address or photograph those things. So yeah. it makes sense that you would be able to have some distance and objectivity if you went into a different milieu, but then, you know, the, the discourse about that is all about um, the perspective of power that a certain photographer brings to another less empowered um, group. 
yeah and how that work is disseminated and and so on but i think um to your credit that i know that many um younger transgender you know people such as zachary drucker have um, acknowledged how important your role has been in creating uh, a body of images that um, documented uh, scenes and movements when other people weren't doing it and created a valuable photographic history. Um, yeah. So it's a good. It's a good question. It is. It's. It's. It is a, a very difficult thing to yeah. answer because I think it's not a black and white question. It's something that, you know. Well, I think. The, excuse me. Yeah. No. I think partly it's really how deeply you immerse yourself in the culture that you are working in. Right. I mean, I. I basically loved a lot of the people. I stayed with them, I cried with them. Um, and that's kind of how I work best. I didn't, I mean, there are photographers who go someplace for two weeks, grab it all and leave. And, you know, I don't think necessarily think that's fair. I think you have to really immerse yourself to the extent you can uh, with the people that uh, you're working with. Gabrielle has a question, which is how, how do you see cross-dressers? Do you consider them to be, this is the question, do you consider them to be men or did you see them as women who were born men but expressing their female side or two selves? Was there an understanding of transgender or transsexuals at the time you were taking these pictures? And um, Elaine might want to jump in and answer that as well. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, there's so many different periods and different thinking and different, I mean, they, these questions have been argued and discussed. I can't tell you how many times and how often and how shocked I am when I discover that um, a, young per a young person who works for me, um, um, who identifies as, um, I guess I would say transsexual, how um, angry she was with the over the idea that cross-dressers could be considered uh, part of the rainbow umbrella. She said, they're just men. Well, there are so many gradient, uh, how do I put that? So many different ways of, of experience your, yourself um, that, and, and the longer we live, the more ways seem to be discovered or expressed. So I, um, I tend to, accept people at their word. If, if somebody is a cross-dresser and is expressing herself as a woman, I accept that. That's, that's who it is that I'm with at that point. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't worry about it. Um, if so, Elaine, would, would you like to comment? Too? Yeah, this is a good place for me to stop. Um, I've met uh, transsexuals who uh, just stayed cross-dressers. I've known cross-dressers who decided to become transsexuals. Um, I remember one particular incident, uh, well, it was a strange uh, difference between whether you're cross you know, your drag queen or your cross-dresser. That used to be a big thing. But now it's sort of like, what brought it to me was once I was at a convention, I was walking down Market Street and a car full of uh, kids basically started throwing eggs at us and yelling faggot and faggot. And, you know, it's like one of those things I couldn't really uh, have a big discussion about, you know, gender and things like that. In other words, when the whole world treats you a certain way, it's sort of like, fine, you know, no matter what you call me, you're still sort of like throwing eggs at me. 
And, um, you know, this has to do with over the years now, a lot of things have just merged together. It, it's just, and it's, and it's good or else what happens is also you realize there's certain stereotypes that aren't true. It's like this last administration, they keep on sewing saying, oh, all these people, you know, you know, in women's bathrooms and all this other stuff are trans. And it's like, they're going after a character, a cartoon, and that's not true. You know, in other words, it's sort of like, so I realize the whole definitions where you're using the words transgendered or other things, it's really what someone else calls me. They can call me anything. I'm, I'm sort of like beyond that now. And um, so I, it's kind of a confused thing, but it was like, you know, if labels, it's like what, you know, it's what you allow people to label you as. And, um, you know, that's their thing, you know. Uh, thanks, Elaine. Um, Mary, another question. Is other women such as Arbus and Nan Golden um, photographed of a variety of people and um, who had identified it in, in some trans way. Um, and they're wondering, it's Steve Jovenko, he's wondering what you think of their work. Um, I mean, those are two huge precedents. Yes. Well, actually, Nan Golden is, is after me. Um, she's younger than I am. And uh, so I would say, um, um, Diana or Arbus, I always felt she was making portraits, self portraits, and that she was finding people who expressed the way she was feeling. And she presented them as the other. Um, which is probably maybe how she felt about herself, that she was the other. Um, I didn't think that her portraits of trans people uh, helped them in any way with the outside world. But I do, as I said, I do think they were, all of the, the whole range of her work were, was about self portraiture. Um, Nan Golden um, really has dealt with a, a somewhat different population um, than, than I have or have in the past. I have gotten to know drag artists and performers, of course, and I have a, a lot of images of those as well. But I would say most of the people that she was working with, um, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, carried their, maybe their um, gender variance in a lighter way. It wasn't their whole, their whole destiny, their whole sense of themselves, their whole, uh, psychology, uh, they were tended to be um, people who could enjoy um, being who they were and not worry so much about it. And of course, this was a different period of history that she has worked with. Well, yeah, her earliest work in the early 70s, there was a big focus on um, life and the bar and mm. drag performances. But she, at the time she also was living with um, people who were doing drag at home and she was taking mm -hmm. pictures of them at home. And some of those people left that drag world behind completely and others mm -hmm. went into a lifelong trans experience. So I mm -hmm. think even with her subjects, it, it varied depending yeah. on the person, right? But I guess the main thing is that they were all young. They weren't Yes. People with families who were married, yes. settled with professions. Exactly. Um, eventually, they had those things, but this it was like a a, a youth culture that mm. she was part of. Yes, yeah. must have been wonderful in certain ways to have to have her friends be there with her all the time. 
And she would dress up herself yeah. and go out just to be the photographer and all these sort yeah. of vintage outfits. And Well, I do some of that myself. <laughs> <Also>. <laughs> I would borrow their clothes so and sometimes. And, you know, which it makes me I, think about you going to these um, things like Fantasia Fair, because after a certain point, you became a regular speaker, right? Yes. I would presenting. do slide presentations and and yeah, so your workshop. your earliest talks were all to um, various trans audiences and yes. I remember reading something that your first talk to an audience of uh, artists or art minded people was you know not that long ago it's at SVA when I invited you to be a yeah. speaker there right yeah yeah. And suddenly, um, suddenly I didn't have to explain nearly as much um, about art. I mean, or why I took a picture. I didn't have to explain why I took a picture because it was clear to people who are in the arts. Okay. Whereas uh, when I would do slide presentations to at transgender events, I would have to explain things in every picture, you know. Otherwise, they wouldn't quite get it very often to say, oh, I like her dress or, ah, she looks good. She, you know, whatever. And I say, yes, that's true. And blah, 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 you know, because I wanted, <laughs> I was trying to give them, I don't know, a little bit of an arts education and also invite them into what I was thinking so that I thought that might make it even a little more interesting than just running through, um, oh, here's so-and-so and, -so and uh, you know, can't you see what a good time they were having or something? There's a question, were any of the people you photographed out living full-time as women? I guess, meaning in that um, 80s period. No. No, and <laughs> but but funny. but later, I think it's interesting. For instance, Tony, um, okay. that you that there were people that you photographed on either side of their transition. So, um, yeah. and there was, and you also photographed their surgeries in some cases. Yes, I I did, and, and I loved. I have to admit, I like photographing surgeries. Um, and births and all those things that um, other people might be horrified by. But I think of those as happy occasions because the, the person is re having themselves rebirthed in the way they want to be. Um, and so every time my friend Tony had another surgery, this is a female to male, I, he would call me, and I uh, lived in Tampa. He would call me, and I would go rushing down to Florida. Said, "I'm having this cert. I'm having that." So, I, I photographed all of his surgeries, and um, I felt, you know, part of the team. I felt, um, I, I was happy for him. I mean, I knew how painful he would it would be for him later, but. And his um, wife and uh, adopted daughter were always part of it too. So it was, um, I have had, I've been for, very fortunate to have had um, amazing adventures over the years. And, and long and long friendships on that community. Long friendships, yes, yes. Well, I care about the people. It's just, what else can I say? That's, I've been lucky. I've met wonderful people. And uh, in some cases, like Elaine and I, we stayed friends over many years and over many experiences. And, and, and last year, you endowed a grant, a $10,000 a year grant for, can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. It's called the Illuminations Grant, and it's for Black transgender women in the visual arts, not performers. Um, 
And those, I did that with, in the suggestion of, um, of uh, one of my assistants. And the idea, of course, is that who gets murdered the most? Who, which part of the transgender population suffers the most violence? And that tends to be black transgender women. And um, we know that there are many um, transgender people who been successful in performance arts, but what about the visual arts? And my idea was, or our idea was, to see if we could create some outreach, um, maybe even to women who weren't clear that they were an artist, that they didn't know necessarily, but they'd been doing something for many years. And uh, maybe their friends had said, oh, I look really like that. But they had they didn't know. And um, we finished our first cycle and we're just about to start the next year and start putting out applications. So um, I'm op we're open to- um, It's done through queer art, right? Yeah, queer art is the administrating arm. But the three of us are, I don't know, we make the decision, the basic decisions and- um, You're part of the jury. We aren't. We have, the jury consists of people who are black and often, and we hope transgender and when, um, and, but not, not all of them, like, you know, Lyle Ashton Harris? Yeah. Yeah, he's going to be on the jury this year. Okay, great. Uh, so, and he's not, you know, um, because we thought that they should be judged by their peers, basically. Um, so every year it's going to be different judges. Usually one will stay on until the next year and then continue. Um, so this is a whole new project and um, another way of being involved with the community, um, especially now when I'm not shooting as much. And uh, do, are you working on another book? Yes, <laughs> I'm, I want to create a, a kind of a retrospective for myself in which I, um, I show transgender images, but along with other images um, to show or to imply that transgender people are, are no longer have to be seen as separate from everybody else. That integration has occurred and maybe not all over the place, but a lot. And um, so why should I just do images of trans people and keep those together as I have in every other book. So this is an experiment, this book, and um, to see if it is possible to mix up images, not even just of other of cis people, but also other kinds of images and let people make their own um, choices. Yeah. Darren, what did you say? Choices. It, um, Reactions. Connections. 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 That's the word. Okay. Connections. Yes. 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 <laughs> they both begin with C. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, um, I, Brian, do you have any question that you wanted to ask? No, I, I, um, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. And um, yeah, we've, uh, it's been an hour and 15 minutes. So um, unless. I think we're, we're good. Yeah, I, I'm satisfied. I'm um, and I, I, once again, I want to thank this wonderful audience. Um, and, mm. and also uh, Elaine for joining us tonight. That was really great to have your commentary, Elaine. And Mariette, thank you so much. Yeah. And congratulations on this wonderful show. 
oh. and their chapter. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And Alan, you couldn't have been more wonderful yourself. And so thank <laughs> you. Thank you. I have thank a you. comment. And, yes. Yeah. Okay. It had to do, you, you were talking about different books on gender, photographic books and portraits. Um, uh, Marriott's the only book that you would give somebody to help introduce like to a family, to someone who's struggling to deal with. I actually have a few extra copies of Transformations just in case I come across um, somebody in need. And that is a good uh, introduction, but that distinguishes that book from all the other books. That's, One of that's the other great, books is sort of like very dated, like the 1980s, you know, the meat market. That's so New York and it does not play in the rest of the United States. Okay. And the other one I really not familiar with or something like that, but this is the, the most uh, voted book for giving to people who are in need. So that's. Oh, thank you, Elaine. All right. Well, um, wonderful evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Thank and you, and Elaine. come see the show. This yes. Show. Yes. yes. If you're in New York. It's up through April 10th. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>